And thanks again for everybody joining us for another one of the Siemens Cinemar Cinemaric webinars. Um, this one is going to be on 5-axis 3 plus 2 G-code programming, specifically with what we call cycle 800 or a swivel cycle. Um, we've, we've done some previous webinars on this content around the shop mill side of the operating interface. Uh, this is going to be all G-code based. This is going to be talking about CAD CAM posted files, uh, some common challenges you might face when programming externally with plane by plane type of functionality. So that's what we're going to be going through over the course of the next probably hour, hour and a half. Okay, I am your host, Chris Pollack. I am a dealer support specialist on the East Coast for Siemens. And here's my contact information. I'm certainly a resource for anybody out there. If you uh, have any questions uh, specific to operation and programming content or uh, want to dig into a little bit of some of the back-end knowledge of the product, I am certainly always a resource here for you guys. So certainly feel free to reach out. Um, best source is probably email, uh, but you can always try to get me on the phone. I do uh, travel a fair amount, so sometimes it's a little challenging to get still reception. Okay, so just to uh, promote a few more webinars that we have coming up here in, um, in the, uh, July, we are going to um, be doing a four-axis mill uh, centered around shop mill programming. And then in September, we are going to be doing one on the new DXF reader, um, but this is specific to software version 4.7. So we had a previous tool that allows us to do DXF functionality. Um, you had to do that externally. And now in software version 4.7, we've actually embedded it into the Cinemaric control directly. So we will be doing a webinar based on that and we'll continue content beyond this, obviously. So today's webinar, everything we talk about will apply to either of our two platforms here, the Cinemaric 828 control or the Cinemark 840D control. Um, so really any of the functionality we talk about, we utilize, will apply to either or no matter what environment you find yourself on or working on. So as I briefly said before, the big thing we want to go through here is starting to leverage our swivel cycle or our cycle 800 in a uh, G-code environment, um, really getting you guys up to speed on not only if I wanted to longhand write it at the control, but more importantly, how do I then handle it with externally posted programs and start to utilize some of this functionality. So we will talk about some setup functions here in the beginning. Um, we do want to point out a few features and functions that will help you with setting up five axis machines, start to direct you into knowing where these offsets are writing to, so you can kind of align them with the method of programming that you're doing. So with that being said, I do want to transition into the setup side of the control and specific to 5-axis. So certainly there's a lot of features and functions here that we can take advantage of, um, but we do want to look at some of the key ones when getting into 5-axis. Um, from, move, from motion, from moving the machine around, it's not going to be any different than a 3-axis machine tool. Um, one of the differences, you're obviously going to have a few more additional axes. So it's going to be up to the OEM how he wants to lay it out on the front panel. Uh, but generally, you're going to see that either the button set, like we see on the right side of the screen, will give you a fourth or fifth axis option. Um, when you get to the pulse generator, your remote hand wheel, it's either going to be some kind of a radial toggle on the hand wheel, um, or sometimes they drive it from the screen um, if there's no axis selector on the handle. Uh, but you'll see that the, the, the system itself, um, because it's so modular, it'll just add the axis functionality to it. So something as basic like the position screen to move the machine around. Well, if it's commissioned as a five-axis machine, you'll immediately get those additional axes in the field. So if you wanted to move the machine not only linear, but also drive the rotaries, you can do that right from any of the native screens you're used to, even running the machine as a simple three- or four-axis variant. Now, when we get to setting up a 5-axis machine, there's a few other steps that we probably don't think about um, when we think about from setting up a simple 3-axis machine. And I always like to kind of relate it back to what a lot of us did back in uh, probably early days of our career. 
on a manual bridge port. So if I walk up to a manual bridge port, what's usually one of the first steps I want to make sure um, that it is accurate? And probably the first thing I'd want to do is just make sure, is the spindle square to my table? Is the machine trammed in? Is my head square? You know, who knows who ran that, that bridge port last? She could be kicked at all kinds of crazy angles. Well, it's the same concept when you get the five axis. I need to set the plane that I'm going to be working on as my base plane first. So that would be my squaring up my head process. Once I've defined that, then I'm going to have to align my workpiece. So that's just like back in the day on that manual bridge port where I was indicating in that vise, as we see from our nice little animated um, picture there on the right. So we're going to want to set that next. And then after, and only after those two features have been set in that sequence, we'll then go and find our part zero. If you don't follow that sequence of events, then the, the datum you're about to set may not be in the same location. So I have to square up the edge or align the edge of my part, but I never set my tool normal. I never actually told the tool that, hey, this is the surface I need to be perpendicular to. Well, that edge may not actually be there anymore because my rotor is going to move. So you always want to follow that process, just like I was setting up that manual machine all those years ago. Set your plane, then set your edge, and then go and find your zero. Now, certainly if I don't need to establish the plane, if I'm working uh, with the datum relative to the machine table, um, then potentially I could, I could skip over that step and go right to the aligned edge. But always think of that process as you go through. So functionally at the control, we've incorporated a bunch of features under the measure work piece tool. Um, the two that we're going to talk about right off the bat would be your aligned plane. That's how I set my tool normal. That's how I square up that head to the surface. And then my align edge. Then from there, you can drive it in, and you can set a zero, and, and you can go from, from that point. So when you go to an aligned plane, most likely you would probably have a probe in the spindle. Could be done manually if you wanted to. But you're really just going to come down. You're going to probe three points on the surface, and that's going to start to write offsets for you to align that surface. Next step will be to do the same process with our align edge function. Now I'm going to touch two points. I see the align edge in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. And by coming in, dataming to those two points, it will then skew or align that plane or that edge, just like I was aligning the vise on that manual bridge port. So where do these offsets start to write? How does this functionality start to work? Well, there's a couple ways I can drive offset data in a multi-axis machine. I can certainly do what we call direct axis offsets, and that would be writing an offset directly to my A or my C. But there's also a whole other method of setting up a machine tool in the Siemens control, which is what we call coordinate rotations, rotations about a linear axis. And that's what I'm seeing in the lower section under the details of my work coordinate field. So here, you're not actually writing an offset to the A axis or the C axis directly. You're actually defining the machine and telling it, I want to do a rotation about a linear axis. So in our example here, I have 10 degrees 10 degrees is a rotation about my x-axis. 5 degrees is going to be a rotation about my y. And then z is going to be 30 degrees about the z. So what the system will automatically do is it will then take these values and then calculate out what the resulting motion would need to be for the table to get to the right location. Now, depending on the cycle you start to use will depend on where it's going to write this data or how you write the data to it. So if we take a look at CineTrain here. I have a basic five-axis machine set up. And we want to start to take a look at these offset tables, or, or these measuring functions, shall I say. I go to my measure workpiece field, and I'm going to get a selection of different measuring cycles up. So if I first look at my align plane, I start to see that it's asking me to start to touch off three different points. Now, initially, it's going to use whatever I happen to have in the spindle. So I would probably want to have a tool change to a probe. So I'm just going to stick a probe in the spindle here real quick. And we can kind of simulate what the process would be to actually align this. But more importantly, I want you to start to get your head around where the offsets are going. So what you're going to do is you're going to go over to the aligned plane. I'm going to jog the machine to a first measured location. Once it's there, I'm going to simply hit cycle start. She's going to feed down in Z until it measures that point. Now it's asking me to just to move to some other random point on that surface. 
So in my case, maybe I'm going to move my Y over a little bit, maybe on my, my Z to some slight new location so I get a little different measurement. Touch that surface. Now I'm going to move to some other location and do one more touch. I'm a little close to the overdrive where she was sitting. Okay. So the system recorded these three points. It hasn't done anything with it yet. It's up to me to tell it to write to the work coordinate. It's going to write to whatever work coordinate I've selected. So right now we have G54 selected. Now, we see we have no other options as to the type of alignment or type of measurement she's going to take. So the minute I set this set work coordinate, what it did was it now wrote to these coordinate rotation fields that I was just explaining. It does give me the option of driving the machine normal to that position. I'm not going to worry about moving it yet. So nothing's physically moved. My rotaries are still at zero. But if I look at my offsets, and I go over to my work offset, we now get a little rotational symbol in the work coordinate level. Now, I have values in A or C. They're still zeroed out. But what I did get is if I go into the details of the work coordinate, just by hitting the details button while I'm highlighting it on the work coordinate, I will start to see that the machine started to calculate in position some data, some coordinate rotations. Now, I was obviously just arbitrarily jogging the machine around. You're going to start to realistically get some small incremental values here. And maybe I got a little bit of a tip in my x-axis or my y. So this is what we call a coordinate rotation alignment. This method is going to be used when you get into what we call kinematic independent programming, which we're going to talk about quite a bit in, in a few minutes here in this content. If you're driving programs from a CAM system and the CAMs are direct axis, you want to be very careful that you don't do coordinate rotation setups because you could run into, depending on how the machine's commissioned, you could run into inconsistency. So I always am an advocate of training people as they get onto these machines. Keep your process consistent. If you want to use coordinate rotations, do everything with coordinate rotations. Now this is more important. I'm just going to get rid of this offset for now. We don't need it. This is more important when you get to the align edge function, because in the align edge function, it's possible for a builder to set up this function to allow you to write directly to your axis. So when you get to align edge, you're probably going to get some options. Now, I can do a coordinate rotation, and this would write to the corresponding axis. If I was just sitting simply a square to my table, and, and I, I found two points, it would write to a rotation about my Z. But I can also drive it directly to the A or the C axis. So what you want to be careful of is you want to be careful getting a mixed bag. I don't want to do a plane rotation that's going to write to my coordinate rotations and then go do an alignment that's going to write to my direct axis because these offsets can start fighting each other. You want to keep it consistent in either method. And generally, I will try to align it to the method of programming I'm using once I get to my part programs. Okay, so as we start to apply these values, the next thing you're going to want to do is now try to anticipate this motion when I start to move the machine around. So, so for argument's sake here, we're showing you a basic rotation that may have been applied around my z-axis. So what will happen is, first thing, as things start to spin around, I might not actually see table movement. You know, let's say for, for argument's sake, I'm in a machine that has two rotaries up in the head. Well, the part can't spin, the part can't move. So as I start to apply these rotations, what it's doing is it's rotating your coordinate system. So the machine has the capability of moving relative to that. If I do any commanded move and the values in the offset, it will always track relative to the values that are sitting in my work offset. However, when I do the jogging, it's important to pay note to this because there's actually two different ways to tell the machine how you want to jog. You can tell it that when I move the axis, it's going to move always relative to the machine coordinate system. Or we have the ability of saying, hey, take into account the values that are in the offset and move relative to those values. And that's where this little WCS-MCS button comes into play. And this is very important, especially when you get on a machine that has mixed kinematics or head-head kinematics, and you want to be able to move relative to this new orientation, this new plane. So how does this work? Well, we'll show you real quick. So whatever offsets happen to be active, I'm just going to force a quick little offset. Let's 
assume that we went in and we found a couple edge points and it wrote in and it wrote some value and I'll just throw 45 degrees in here wrote some value as a rotation about my Z axis so nothing spun just because there's a value here it didn't spin a C axis rotary everything's still sitting at zero but the coordinate system spun so if I was to jog the machine in x-axis right now and not do anything special, I'm looking at my display, all right, and I start to move the machine, I'm going to just crank down my override. You see how I see two numbers moving? Now, now, the machine's not actually tracking with two axes spinning. In fact, if I were to display my actual machine values, which is showing me what my physical motors are doing, and I jog it, I only see the x-axis move. But since the work coordinate system is now rotated about the Z, as I jog, I'm getting further away or closer to that plane in two axes. So this is where the W6MCS button comes in. Let's say you wanted to throw an indicator in the spindle. You want to indicate across that edge and track that edge. Well, by saying to the system, hey, I want you to jog now relative to whatever values are in the work coordinate system by putting this light on and then picking an axis. Now, as I'm displaying the work coordinate system, if I jog the machine, I only see one number changing. But if you physically look at your actual machine values, then we start to jog it, we see we got two servos tracking. So what, where I like to use this a lot is, you know, I may, go on, I may go in, I may align to a plane, it may rotate my coordinate system around at some funny angle. And the first step is I may not know which direction X and Y really are in anymore, right? Because they've been rotated around some orientation. So the first thing you want to do is get yourself oriented. So if I need to jog my X or if I command X to move, what direction is it going in? You know, it's going to be probably skewed at some angle. The next question is what is plus and minus, what is minus, right? I could spun all the way around so where plus and minus appear to be backwards relative to the machine coordinate system. This gets important when you start to use your measure workpiece functions. You know, maybe I wanted to um, align to a couple holes, right? And I'm going to datum one, datum two. Well, if I don't know which direction x plus and x minus is in, I might start at the wrong location, or she might go moving to the wrong direction. So you want to get yourself kind of orientated to this rotation as we start to spin things around, especially because remember you have full freedom, full range of motion here. You can position that coordinate system anywhere you want. So these are some of the tricks you're going to start to do. But really, all this functionality, it's, it's really all just getting used to the cycles that are available and then where they're writing the data to. And again, they're writing the data directly to the work offset. You can see this detail button either in the active field or if you look at all your work coordinates, you always get a detail. It's always going to give you the details of whatever work coordinate you have highlighted. So let's say I'm on 56, I had details. I don't have any values in this one specifically, so everything's at zero. However, if I go to work coordinate one, G54, now I see where we had some numbers displayed. Okay, so what we're gonna do is our next step is we're gonna actually get into um, starting to look at the program in a little more detail and some of these features and functions. I wanted to just give you guys a little more of a detailed description. If you refer back to the shop mill webinar as well, I did go through a lot of this setup stuff for five axis um, in some detail as well. So you can always refer back to that one. Okay. So now we're in jog, we're applying these offsets, we're moving the machine around. I'm probably going to want to be able to then swing the table normal to this surface because I'm going to want to continue to move in the operation sense. So let's say we were to have you know, aligned our plane. We touched three points, um, but I want to now move so my physical tool is square to that surface, whether it's my spindle tipping over because I have a head-head kinematic or it's the trunnion swinging or some combination thereof. I need to have a way of, of driving the machine to a location and then letting it present that surface without having to try to crank it over or jog or command each axis. So that's where it comes into us having embedded a simplified version of cycle 800, the swivel cycle, which we're going to be using in programming. And we put it here in jog for you guys to use as part of your setup process. So that's what you're seeing here. So in the jog screen, 
in the lower right-hand corner, we have the swivel function. And what we did was we probably came in, aligned to some surface, and then I want to go normal to that surface. So I can start to drive the machine to this location. Now, this swivel cycle is going to come very handy, um, not only for presenting the surfaces from setup feature, but also maybe I need to cancel a rotation because I had to shut the machine off halfway through a machining process and my rotaries are contorted at some position. So what you're going to do is you're going to use the swivel feature that we see right here in conjunction with this alignment. So let's say, like we were playing around with before, we went through and we aligned three points. So let's say for argument's sake, in our work coordinate, it ended up that it calculated a 10 degree rotation around X and a negative three degree around Y. Okay, so I would have probed the three points, those values would be there, but the machine hasn't moved yet. And I don't really know where it's gonna to move to make that surface normal. Well, that's where the swivel cycle comes in. So in the swivel cycle, I can first enable what we call our tool carrier or our swivel name. This is what's loading all the offsets in the back end that's managing the kinematics of the machine. I can tell it, hey, I want to get the head up into a safe spot, get it out of the way. We're going to go through all these features again in the programming area. And then I can drive the machine to some rotation. But if I do an initial zero and I just tell it to do a retract and everything that's zero, what it's going to do is she's going to move to this position relative to whatever work coordinates loaded, and it will use the offsets. So now I see the machine moved to negative 10.436, and it calculated a rotation of 160 degrees. Well, it calculated this value based on the measurement I had taken or the offsets that are written right here. So if you're doing the process, just like we talked about earlier, and you know, I align my, my spindle or I align my head to the table, and then I want to align my edge or my datum surface. Well, I would need to present that surface first, right? I want to I want to make it square. I don't want to have that surface at some weird angle when I try to measure the x or the edge of it. Same thing here. So this is where you're going to use it through your process. When I'm when I'm doing my setup, I'll measure my plane. I'll come in. I'll drive her normal to that surface then maybe we'll square up. So, so maybe it went and it took a measurement and it found that it had to apply a little offset in the z-axis of, I don't know, 15 degrees, just to throw some numbers at it. Well, to make that one active, I just come back to the swivel cycle, recycle start, machine now moved to some other rotation. And now we're aligned. And then I can go in and I can set my zero. And certainly set my zero would be the same as I would do on any machine. I could do a basic edge kick. We could come in and we could, oops, sorry. We can maybe find the center of a feature, find the center of a hole. I mean, however you're going to do that process. Now, the other thing I mentioned was what happens if I was moving the machine around. So let's say for argument's sake, it was uh, jogged at some contorted position, wherever it happens to be. And I want to drive her back to zero, to machine zero. Well, that's another area where I can use a swivel cycle. So I can shut the program off, come out to swivel, let it do a safety retract, and tell it initial. Now remember, it's going to use whatever's in the work coordinate. So in this case, it's not going to drive all the way to zero, just the compensated value of that offset. However, if I don't want any offset values, as long as I have zero in these, It'll also allow me to drive the machine back to machine zero. So now everything goes back to zero, machine's in place. And the final thing I like to use the swivel mask for is canceling of the swivel cycle. So whenever the swivel cycle's on, you get this little indication right here that the carrier name is loaded and you get this little green box that says it's active. That means that there's offsets in play that are tracking or moving the machine motion or affecting the machine motion. In fact, if you were to go to your offset table and look at your active offsets, it starts to show you some of these offset values that are starting to come into, into, into effect as I move the machine around. Well, if you want to just cancel all active offsets, come in here, select as a zero, cycle start, and that will also cancel the swivel cycle record. So you're going to use it for those couple things. Um, certainly aligning during the process of, of setup. 
for obviously re, you know sending her back to a safe location when I'm done. Like maybe I I shut her off in the middle of a, of a cycle, and then canceling the record. Now additionally, I have a couple different options here to cancel the record. Probably the next and the most common would just be just doing a simple MDI. And what you'll see in a lot of your G code programs, especially if they're posted out, you're just going to see a simple cycle 800, open close parenthesis. That would do the same thing as what we just did with the swivel cycle, toggling it to zero. That would physically cancel the tool name or tool carrier and all the offsets associated with it, and then I would expect to see it go blank. All right. Okay, so from here, Let's move on to the programming section of the control, and we want to start to talk about the swivel cycle in a little bit more detail here. So first and foremost, this is going to be the basic program that we're going to go through and talk about having methodized this part. So we'll, we'll pop this up again in a little bit before we start writing the program. But initially, let's talk about the cycle 800 or the swivel cycle. So the function itself supports two different types of features. So you can do plane rotation or plane orientation. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow me to basically present a surface and make that surface perpendicular to spindle. So when I'm all said and done, the XYZ coordinate system, your UCS, your unit coordinate system, will be aligned to that surface and Z will be perpendicular to the surface I present. On the flip side, I also can do what's called tool orientation. So that would allow me to tip or angle the tool relative to a surface, but the work coordinate system stays aligned to where it was originally on the part. It's not moving the Z. So for argument's sake, uh, we're, we're machining a freeform surface, and we want to tip the tool 30 degrees but just tip the tool, the work coordinate system is going to stay where it was originally. You can use this in this align tool functionality. Now this webinar, we're specifically talking about plane rotation, so the feature on the left. Um, I would say the feature on the right it can be used on uh, standard machines more commonly. I see it used in five axis lathes with B axes. That's where it's really handy because it allows me to, you know, tip my tool orientation, my turning tool, set it offset to a surface and you can start to drive it around without it affecting the work coordinate system. Could be used on a mill. I've certainly done it with machining like freeform surfaces, but we're going to concentrate on the one on the left. So what, what is it doing? You know, as I was just stating, it's, it's establishing a plane and it's moving the work coordinate system, that unit coordinate system, to that new surface and then making the X, Y, and most importantly Z aligned to the machine spindle. Now, the result of motion is obviously going to change or vary from machine type to machine type. But the mask, the cycle, is a constant. And that's what's really nice about this. So no matter what type of machine we put this on, you're going to use the exact same setup every time in the, in the programming environment. You don't have to learn different types of swivel cycle for different types of machine kinematics. So. What would I see in resulting motion in probably most, our two most common types of machine? A swiveling table, which would be a trunnion style table or a swiveling head. Well, again, for that same exact interface screen, I'm going to get two different motions entirely. One's going to physically rotate the tool tipping over. The other one's going to rotate the part. But it's the same cycle that's driving both of these behaviors. So how does it work? Well, first step, it allows me to slide or move my coordinate system. The second step, it's going to let me rotate. And in my third step, it'll actually allow me to shift the coordinate system one extra time. So if you noticed in this little animated element on the left here, we actually took our zero, we slid it to some point, we rotated, and then we slid it to a new location, and that's establishing a new zero. So a new zero not only in a orientation, an angular orientation, but in a new linear position too. Well, that's going to be handled inside of the cycle 800. And then a few extra things that you'll see. So just to kind of um, reaffirm it, um, so this is four of your most common types of kinematics you're going to see in the, on a five-axis machine. 
first one to our left is going to be a head head. So this has two rotaries up in the spindle. The part would stay um, fixed. We have a mixed kinematic. So I have a rotary up on my spindle and another rotary down on my table. You have a table table kinematic. And that's where both rotaries are down on the table. This could be a BC, AC, a couple different ways. And then you get into what's called nutated rotary axes. And that's where the table or the rotary isn't actually perpendicular to the linear axes. They're at some kind of angle. Um, you can see that actually here with this mixed kinematic. This is a nutated axis because see how the A itself is sitting what looks like a 45 degree angle. So the swivel cycle will support any of these types of kinematics. Now, there's a few different ways to drive the data to the swivel cycle. You can do what we call kinematic independent programming. Um, and the two methods there, probably two most popular, would be axis by axis or projected angles. And then you can also do what's called direct axis programming. That's what's called kinematic dependent. Now, what do I mean by kinematic independent or dependent? Well, basically, if I'm writing a program, is there something in that program that will only allow it to run on that specific machine type? So the minute I call out the rotaries, so the machine we're on actually happens to be an AC rotary configuration. Well, the minute I actually write a program using the A, this will only ever run on a machine with an AC rotary configuration. It won't run on a BC. It won't run on a mixed kinematic. So what you did was you wrote the, the program kinematically dependent. It has to have those axes for it to run. In kinematic independent programming, like we see on the left for axis by axis, axis by axis is just describing a rotation about a linear axis. Well, every machine has X, Y, and Z. The linear axes are always there. So when you write a program with kinematic independent programming, it now allows you to move that program to any type of five axis machine without any editing required or minimal editing at that. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, in detail here, we're going to talk about the axis by axis method, but we'll also refer back to direct axis a little bit. Okay, so when you start to write specially kinematic independent, you are allowing the machine to make some choices on its own. So a lot of times when I'm doing a rotation, if I have enough travel, I can actually have two different options or scenarios to get to the same location. So I see I have alternate one, where the A tips towards me, or alternate two, the A tips away from me. So assuming the machine has enough travel to get through both scenarios, and that would just be a limitation of the machine if it did not, we have two options. So in this cycle, you can drive which solution it's going to use by your direction field. So that's going to allow you, if for some reason there were two scenarios, and the machine chose an undesirable orientation, you can drive that from the swivel cycle as well. When you get to direct axis positioning, there's only one result because there's only one location. So then you don't have to worry about that. And in fact, there is no direction option when a direct axis solution is chosen. So we're going to come in. We're going to create a new program. We are going to create a G-code based program. And we're going to build a simple program based on this job. Now, one of the first things we're going to talk about is the safety lines. And this is very important because this is going to set up basically how the rest of the program is going to start to respond. And we, we want to make sure that we start to do this initialization no matter how the program is coming to us. So whether it was created in a CAD CAM system and be brought over or you're programming longhand at the control. So really these first four lines you see here, I want to see everybody make this as a standard process. So we're going to basically orient the tool, get everything up to a safe position, and square up everything based on a cycle 800. We're then going to cancel cycle 800 because we're not sure if we're going to be using it yet or not at this point in the program. We're going to add our simple safety line. And most important, we're going to have our work coordinate called up here. And then we're going to set up our workpiece blank. Now, the workpiece blank isn't mandatory. This is going to help us for our simulation. Um, but if you don't do this step and this process, then a bunch of things could potentially happen. For argument's sake, if I threw the workpiece blank up as the first line of the program, and it was before the work coordinate, as before any cycling 100 orientation, and I had some active offsets different than the part program, well, it can shift your workpiece into some position, and it's off in space. 
and you think that there's something wrong. Well, it's really doing what you told it to do, which is set up the workpiece, but wherever the machine happened to be sitting, or was modally sitting. So this process will keep from that happening. It will also make sure that the head's in a safe location, the table's squared up, and just give you get you ready for 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 going for moving forward into your, your part programming. From there, we're then going to start to move some things around. So here we're just showing you, I wanted to give you a little bit more of a visual of where the coordinate system is going to be when we start this program. So in our case, we're going to say that the lower left-hand corner was 0, 0. And if I look at, from a rotational standpoint, everything at initial would be parallel to the bottom of the part, which would be parallel to the, the platter on the machine and nothing's going to be rotated. So that's really what that first cycle of hunter is going to do, is it's going to allow me to kind of square up, make sure everything's straight, and then we'll cancel it, we'll start our safety line and move from there. Then we're going to start to use the cycle of hunter to start to drive around this motion. So we'll talk about the table names, we'll talk about some different retraction strategies, and then how do I move my zero around? How do I apply some rotations? From there, we then have to start to shift things. So I'm going to start to move around my unicoordinate system, my UCS, driven by cycle 800. So in this case, in this little example, we shifted the zero over 50 millimeters. So it centered the zero on the part. And then we applied a rotation, oops, let me go back, I clicked on that, rotation around the x-axis, 90 degrees in the negative. Now, what did that do on this machine? Well, that did a rotation about A. Had I been on a machine that was a BC, the machine would automatically spin the platter in 90 degrees and then tip it around B because it understands there is no A axis. So when you're part programming, you don't really have to worry yourself so much about where the rotaries are, what rotaries are there available for me. Next operation is going to be cut some 45s on the part. So then we're going to set the work coordinate system at an angle. 45, so we'll do a rotation about Y, and then we'll maybe move my zero around in space. So we're going to go through that. Then we'll get a chance to start to run the tool path. We'll do a little simulation. And what I have here in this machine is this machine is um, actually set up for collision avoidance. So it gives me a machine space model. So you'll be able to start to see the trunnion you move around too, and that'll give you a much better visual as to what's really happening. Okay. So let's start to write a program. Now I'm going to bring up a print here for us just so you can kind of keep it in the corner and we'll start to build this basic program for us. All right. So, so what we have here is to keep us from having to go through the entire thing and give us a little bit of time because there's a lot of content here. I'm going to grab I'll program and drop it up here. And we'll use this as our example. Okay. So first things first, when you're going to start to build your program or set up, you have to know where cycle 800 exists. How do I get to the cycle 800 function? So when you're editing a program or creating a program, first thing you're going to do is go under the various button, and that's going to give you the swivel plane feature. Swivel plane is the cycle 800, the swivel cycle map. So if you want to get in to that cycle, just hit various, hit swivel plane, and it's going to pop you up the mask. Now the first thing you're going to do is you're going to come in, you're going to hit swivel plane, and you're going to hit this initial button, initial settings. An initial setting is going to set it up to a default solution, and it's going to zero out everything for you. So then you just want to kind of come over it and make sure that this is exactly what you want. So first thing I'm going to want to do, this is the start of my program. I'm going to want to make sure that I send the head someplace safe. So that's what's called your retract strategy. So if the value is at a no, then the machine's not going to move at all. So we have a couple different retract strategies. And depending on the way the machine was commissioned by the builder, there are some more or less you'll see here. This one happened to be commissioned where it allows you to do a straight Z retract. That'll move the Z to the extent of its travel in a plus direction. You can do what's called a maximum tool direction retract. That would move the tool out at whatever orientation angle it's at until it over travels, but not letting it fully over travel. Or you can do an incremental retract, and that would just be a small incremental move up away from wherever the machine was sitting. 
So from a safety standpoint, you're going to want to do a full retract up. Then you're going to want to make sure all the values are at zero. Now you're probably not going to know what the direction solution you would normally want would be yet, so we're going to leave it at its default. And then I'm not going to want to use tracking in this case. I'm going to do do not track. You fill out the page, you hit accept, and it's going to build this first event for you. Now, like I said before, the next step in the program is going to then be canceling of cycle 800. So there's two ways you could do that. If you're at the machine and you're just adding a cycle real quick, if you go to various again and you go to swivel plane, I can select the swivel record or our tool carrier, like we like to call it, under the TC field. But I also select a zero. So a zero here hitting accept will build the full cycle but really, it's looking at this name, the second variable to the right. If it sees the name record, it's going to load all those, all those offsets, all those parameters in the back end. If it sees a zero, it's going to cancel it. So this line would be the same as also doing a cycle 800, open, close, parenthesis. I would say from a posted program perspective, more likely than not, I'm going to see the cycle 800 with the open, close, parenthesis. A lot easier for a post developer to type in. If I'm longhand programming at the control, it's a lot easier to just go to swivel plane, pick a zero, and, and accept it. So six of one, half dozen of the other, you can certainly use either one. I'm going to get rid of that. Then I want to set up my safety line. So typically, I would probably set a tool plane or a tool orientation of G17, um, load whatever work coordinate I'm going to be using. Do I want to be in absolute incremental mode? And then what's my unit of measure, inch or metric? this program happened to be methodized in metric. Now you want to set up your workpiece blank. So the workpiece blank is going to set up the stock. So it's going to set up the blob for us. Now, depending on your, your machine commissioning, it may or may not have this clamping field. Um, some of the older software, we only introduced the clamping field in 4.5, so you wouldn't have seen it earlier. Um, some builders don't put it at all. If the, if the machine is commissioned for clamping, though, you do want to make sure that you set this, and you set this relative to whatever the orientation of the part is for your rotaries. If you neglect to set this and you leave it at table, then it's not going to show you five-axis simulation when you get to the simulation screen. It's only going to show you three-axis, so it's going to look certainly strange. So if I'm doing a basic, um, basic C-axis clamping, where my A would be at zero, and my platter would be square to my table, I would pick a C-axis orientation. And then you just define your block. And, and what are the basic size of the block? No different than any other program we've ever done in shop mill or in G-code. And say accept. Now, we set up certainly a tool. I grabbed a 20 mil cutter that was in the tool page, um, loaded my offset, did a tool change, set up some speeds and some feeds, maybe coolant, however I'm going to drive it. And now it's time to start doing some tool path, right? So everything's square, nothing's really happened. Just put a tool in the spindle. So your first step then is to now present the first surface we want to machine. So if you look at your part print, we need to machine a nine degree angle down this face. So to do that, and remember my, my zero is this lower left hand corner, and it's right on the top, so it's straight. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now create a swivel cycle, I want to make sure that I'm calling up the tool carrier, probably get the head to some safe spot. It's already up there, so I can leave it there. And now I can start to move the machine around. So in this case, we decided to shift the X over. So what will happen is this first motion, this first move, this is a linear shift of your X, Y, Z, zero. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the X, Y, Z, zero is on the corner that you're rotating about. Hand systems won't typically do that, and that's okay. When you're longhand programming, though, it makes it a lot easier if at the end of the day, your zero is on the surface that you're rotated on, on an established plane. It makes you have to do less math. So here we were just shifting the zero to center it. I'm not doing any shift in X or Y, and now I'm choosing the strategy, the option of how I want to rotate the core, the physical machine. How do I want to give it the information to tell it what I'm going to do to rotate? So we can do axis by axis. We can do projected angles. Or we can do direct axis. 
But again, this is what we call all kinematic dependent. So once I do this method, first I have to think a lot more because I have to kind of track where I need to present my C platter. Um, but additionally, this will only ever run on an AC machine. So what we're going to do is we're going to do axis by axis. So now I only really have to think about, well, what axis am I rotating about? Well, if I want to tip it to come down the surface, I'm rotating about the x-axis. So once I know, I want to just choose my sequence of events. Because when you start to do axis by axis rotation, there's an order of dependency. So if I had a value in both x, y, and z, and they're different numbers, and I tell it I want to do an x, y, z solution or a z, y, x solution, the result will be totally different. So you do have to think about, as I'm applying rotations, which should happen first. If there's only one rotation, it makes no difference how you set up the sequence. It'll always go to the same position. But the minute you have some kind of compound rotation, then you want to think about it. So I always like to get guys in the habit of picking the axis they would want to rotate about first. In this case, x. Tell it the angle of rotation. Here we're going to do negative 9 degrees because I'm tipping it down. I'm not doing any rotations in my y or my z, so I can leave them blank or leave them at zero. And then, do I want to shift the zero now relative to this new plane? So how do I want to slide the zero down this, this angled surface here, right? Well, then I could do that. So later, we're going to set the zero to the center of the part. We can choose the tracking method, which way we want this thing to tip. And then, do we want to have the tool follow the move? Well, if I'm all the way up at Z0, right, I retract the machine all the way to the extent of its travel, I don't need to do tracking. If actually, if I try to do tracking, I'll probably get an over-travel alarm. So I, we, I methodized the part a little bit so we can look at it a little later with tracking. Um, that's if, you know, I have a lot of travels on my machine or I want to methodize a real nice-looking demo, let's say, um, then we'll start to use tracking. Tracking does require the machine to be commissioned with Traori. Traery is our five-axis, full site simultaneous or dynamic toolpath function. So if you're on a machine, like an 828, that doesn't support Traery, you won't even get the tracking option. Um, or if your machine doesn't have it, you may not get this tracking option. Okay. So you fill out the page, you save it, and then you just really apply some toolpath. So in our case, we were just going to face off this part. So I used a basic mill and a basic face mill cycle. So the cycle itself will then come in and allow me to define some parameters, and I move on. So had I put a quick little M30 here, if I was to go simulate this, we'll now see that the machine is just going to machine that first surface. So there is our 9-degree surface, and then it pulls out, and it's done. What would the motion look like? Well, if I was to, to run this, I would see it tip the A-axis and then cut the part. So from there, as you start to move around or methodize these types of programs, it's going to be a lot of the same sequence or events. So the next thing would be, well, what, what else do I want to cut with this facing tool? So maybe I want to take these 245s off each corner. So now I have to shift my unicoordinate system to some point that's relative to this surface. So when I'm looking at the swivel cycle, and as we're coming down, uh, certainly it asks for my plane. That's going to stay at my standard G17 that, that I normally would. Tool carry, we would always want to have turn on, probably a retract strategy. And we have this option called new or additive. So the way this works is generally I always try to use new, but think of this like the difference between incremental or absolute positioning. A new rotation will always revert back to wherever the zero point is for G54. An additive rotation will build on the last rotation. So remember, the machine is currently sitting at a 9-degree tip. Well, I don't need that 9-degree tip anymore, because if I look at the print, these corners are parallel to the bottom. Well, by doing a new, it automatically cancels those rotations. If you want to think of it in your own head as the table is going to go back straight before it does that rotation, that might be clearer. Um, it won't actually send the table straight. It'll go right to this new rotation. 
But this is going to keep you from having to unwind anything, right? Tip anything back. So from there, I then really just position my zero. So since my zero is back at this corner, I then want to rotate. Now, remember earlier I said you want to have the, the zero somewhere on the surface that's about to rotate on. So if I didn't, if I rotated right here in this corner and tipped it around 45 degrees, well, now I'd have to calculate how far down this surface is from that point, because that would become my zero. But on my print, I know that this lower edge is 30 mil down. So prior to rotating, in this case, if I shift my Z 30 millimeters down, I can then do a rotation about Y, negative 45 degrees. That's going to tip. So my Z is now perpendicular to this surface. I don't need to do any other shifts. So then I just save it. And now we use a facing cycle to handle that. So now I'm going to just tell it the basic parameters in my X. So we gave it about 43 millimeter right here to work up the side. The length of the part for this angle, 100 millimeters. A step over amount, depth of cut. Now, in this case, my Z0 is the, the finished surface. So all of my stock is in a plus direction. So that's why I have a positive value here in Z0. So when I get to physically get to zero, let's tell me right here, I will be on that surface. And then you're just going to kind of repeat the process. So if I want to machine this other 45, I come in. I'm going to now slide my zero over to the other side in X. Now, there's no sequence or order of operations in the linear slide. It's always going to get you to the same point. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, I'm not shifting my Y, but I am shifting my Z down. That's going to put me down to this corner. Then I'm going to do another 45, but now this is going to be the opposite direction. So this is a positive 45 around my Y. So the only other thing that I now have to think about is when I did the facing cycle. Since my zero is on the right side of the feature, not on the left side of the feature now, my X is in a negative direction. That's about the only thing that has to change between the two. So from here, if we put a quick M30 and we look at it, we now have our three surfaces machined out. So there's the nine degree plane. And she's going to tip over and it's doing that left side at negative 45. Now we get the right side. Now certainly if maybe this was too aggressive a cut, I can move my Z0, my, my starting datum up a little bit. We had put positive 10 mil. Um, I would want to be more poor, you know, more attention to that if I was really going to cut this part, certainly. And then and you can continue on. Now in this case, we're going to come in. We're going to... Um, we're doing the pocket with the same tool that we had for the other planes. So now we're going to get back to our nine degree plane, position the zero in the center. But in this case, we have one extra step we're going to do. So if we look at the dimensioning of the pocket and relative surface, it's 50 millimeters down, but it's down this surface. So for me to get there, I want to shift my zero after the rotation. So now when I get to the pocket, I simply only have to give it an X zero, Y zero, and it'll machine the pocket at the center of that feature. Now, could I have not slid the zero down and then put the positive 50 mil right here in the Y? Absolutely. It's kind of a six and one half dozen the other. This is really handy if I'm going to be calling up subprograms that are written from a specific zero location. Well, now I don't have to try to manipulate them. I can allow the cycle to establish the new zero, and then just call up the sub, and it can do that common feature again. Once we're all said and done, here we're going to put a little chamfer on the edge of the part. So this is a final. Now, in this case, we used an additive. So our zero was right here, all right? And now we want to come down and we want to do a final rotation around this corner. Well, this is a good example of where an additive becomes helpful. So by choosing additive, I can just do an additional shift down the plane 
this case, the math calculated out 51.1 degree, uh, one millimeters. And now, since the 45 is actually relative to the face, then I can tell it to do a 45 degree rotation, and it's actually 45 plus the nine. Had I not done an additive, then I would have to take into account the nine degrees additionally. So we do the additive, we did a couple simple feed moves to drive her over to the chamfer. Now, before you get to tool changes, however, this is an area you always want to think about a little more detail. And a lot of it depends on, is the tool change dependent on whether or not this rotation is active? So what do I mean by that? Well, we're in a head-head machine. So my tool is physically tipped at some angle. And now I'm going to go drive it up to a tool change. Well, it needs to straighten that tool out prior to doing the tool change. I would hope that the tool change macro will handle that. But I don't like to leave things that I can control in other people's hands. So I would generally make it a good rule of practice to, at the end of the day, prior to my, this was actually wrong. <laughs> Glad I looked at it. Um, prior to my tool change, I would want to square everything up, send her to zero. That puts us in a safe location. Then drive the machine through a tool change. Now, in this case, since it's squared back up, I want to make sure I represent my orientation. I'll look like that had gotten moved. So let me go back and grab. Cut, copy, and paste is a beautiful thing. So this should be our nine degrees. Yes, it is. Uh, no, it's probably this one we want to use. Because my zero is the center. Yep. So let's copy that. Place that right here. So I reset my orientation. That's going to position me back to the center of the feature for my volatile pattern. And then we just use a standard drilling cycle like you guys have seen plenty of times before in other webinars. Set the locations. I'm just going to use a volatile pattern. Cancel it. Now, at the end of the program, just like at the beginning, I'm a big advocate for send the machine back to its safe location, Z retract, send everything back to zero, use that initial function, and then cancel the swivel cycle when you're done. So at the end of the day, or at the end of the program, we're going to get a methodized complete part. And there we go. Now, what if we wanted to play around with the tracking? What if we wanted to kind of see what that's going to do? So right now, if I was to look at this part and we were to run it in auto, now we have an, a feature in here under simultaneous record where I can bring up the machine space model. So this was the kinematic of the machine. This is the type of machine uh, we are on right now. So this would be a Trunnion style gantry. All right, so I have an A, so I have an A rotary. I can move that around. We can jog it around a little bit. And then we have a C rotary that spins around. You can kind of see the platter spinning. It's a little hard to see without anything on it. Okay. So we want to we wanna run this, we want to run this part. So I'm just going to turn off collision avoidance. Our good, I already got it off, so I don't have to worry about it. So by running the program, we'll start to see what the actual motion would look like. So here, machine's going to machine down the surface, tip the table. So again, for those Ys, right, when I need to do the rotation about, about Y, it automatically spot on the platter, the desired rotation, and presented that surface. Now, let's say for argument's sake, I didn't want it to tip back. I wanted it to tip forward for some reason. Maybe I, I had the potential of a uh, collision. Maybe there was a clearance issue, a big fixture up here. That's where that plus or minus uh, scenario comes into play. So had I chose a positive as opposed to a negative, and we looked at it, now when it goes to this 45, watch where the table goes. And there it tips the other way. So that's where that plus or minus strategy comes into. And again, assuming the machine has the travel to get there. This one obviously can rotate the full uh, the full amount either direction in my A axis. 
Now, if I want to look at what the tracking function would look at, right now, every time, I'm going to slow her down a little bit so you can kind of see it. Uh, all right. Every time the machine goes to do a rotary move, it's bringing the head all the way up to machine zero. Rotates the axis, brings it up, rotates the axis. Certainly there can be some lost time there, especially if I had a very large, uh, very large machine with a lot of travel. Well, if you have the tracking function and you're not doing a tool change, that's an area where I can get to a clearance point and then follow the track position. So if you look at the next program we have set up here, I have it with tracking. Now, the difference here is when I got to a second or third rotation, I used the track function. So there's two things I did. One, I didn't use a retract all the way up to Z anymore. I used what's called an incremental tool retract. So that's just saying wherever you're sitting, I want to back up some amount. In this case, I backed up 10 millimeters. And then I said, okay, now I want you to track. So you see on our little animated element how the tool is following the rotation? So that's a dynamic move. So simply by changing my retract strategy and adding my tracking function to it, now if you watch the program, you'll see how the machine will start to track around in those positions. So here's our first nine degrees. So there, see how the tool stayed down low to the part? Now you do want to watch with the tracking because you could potentially end up in a solution where the tool is lower than that surface. Um, but that's the way the tracking will start to apply for us. And I can see if I can slope with that a little bit more. It's hard in, uh, it's hard in these to, to get the speed down. So that's probably as slow as I'm going to be able to make it. Right here, there you go. You see a little bit. So see how it was down when it did that nine degree rotation. Here we'll feed over. Let's slow it down. So you start to see it. Now she's going to come up a little bit. Tracks with the surface, moves over. So that's a good one because that one kept me above the surface. But if you watch this next one, once we get done. Take one more cut. Pulls back. This is a case where I'm actually ending up, hard to see there, but I'm ending up below the surface. So the machine had to pull up and get over it. So there I may want to use a little larger retract strategy before I did that, that tracking move. So instead of just the 10 mil up, maybe I want to go 100 mil up or 50 mil up. Okay. All right. So that, that should start to give you guys a little bit of the flavor and get, kind of get your head a little bit around how this starts to methodize from a G-code perspective. But the next thing we want to really look at is um, CAD CAM-based programs, right? So what would I expect and what are some of the challenges when I start to get into externally posted programs using this type of cycle? So. We're going to start to look at some CAD CAM output a little bit. We have a, uh, this, uh, this example methodized coming out of a CAD CAM system. And I'm going to show you some of the challenges and some of the little hurdles you can kind of get around to maybe make this a little easier for you. So first things first, our cycle 800 is a complex cycle. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. The CAD CAM systems don't have to, to certainly take advantage of all this functionality that's at the cycle level. but a lot of times, you know, these guys, they're not Siemens experts. They have to write posts for all sorts of controls. So we got to give them a little bit of slack here and there, especially when you get to such a complex cycle like this. So when you, when you get your post, when you get your output, what I always like to do as a testing method for any CAN cycle that's been posted externally is I like to open up the cycle. And one of the first things you could see here is if there's a problem with the cycle, the mask should give you some kind of an alarm. So in this case, the post builder was trying to use an axis by axis solution that's being driven by this type 57 here, but he didn't set up properly the direction option because he didn't even realize he had to support it. So 
the system tells me. Had I ran this without opening up, I probably would have gotten an alarm when I went to physically run the PAR program. So this is a quick, simple, easy way to, to check any CAN cycle. High speed cycle, 832, uh, drilling cycles, any of the CAN cycles, if you want to check, first thing I always do, open them up and take a look at the mask and see if, if the cycle thinks it's okay. Now, the number certainly could be wrong. Um, it's not going to know that. But if there's, if there's setup issues in the cycle, we'll catch that right here. Now, where do I go to figure out what all these indexes, what all these places are? See, it's really easy with the control, right? You have the luxury of opening up this data mask. And even externally within CindyTrain, like you're seeing, I have that, that option. But what if I'm writing the cycle from a CAD CAM system in a post and I don't have the luxury of having a Siemens control in front of me? Well, you're going to want to go to our support website. So it's support.industry.siemens.com. And in here, you can get to all sorts of documentation. But the, the Bible, in my, my humble opinion, is what we call our job planning manual. So come to the support network, the Siemens Industry Support Network, type in job planning. It'll do a search, and it'll come up with this PDF. Download it and save it. Inside of the job planning manual, there is a chapter, chapter 19 you see right here in the list, called Programming Cycles Externally. And what it does is it breaks down every cycle within the control, cycle 800 included, and talks about each variable and what they are. So if I wanted to know what the um, eighth place over meant, right, that would be counting it out between commas, one, two, three, all the way to eight. Here it'll tell me that's the rotation rotation axis to the settings. Now, it, it's a little cryptic, so it's referring to A mode. So our underscore mode function, I would have to look to see, okay, well, what is option four set up for? One, two, three, four. That goes back to, uh, let me go back to a program, the type 57, right? One, two, three, four. So what it's saying is, depending on what setting I'm in, in, in mode will depend on the functionality of this parameter. It's dependent on that, right? If I'm in a if I'm in a axis by axis type 57, well then I'm not going to use a direct axis position here, right? I'm going to use a rotation, a coordinate rotation. So you, you'll have to get your head around it a little bit the way they layout, but it is priceless when you're trying to dig into these cycles and figure out what each of these variables means. Now. The other thing that we get a lot of guys question about is the number of commas. And you know, a lot of guys maybe think, oh, the, the builder is manipulating this because there's more, more commas on one machine than the next machine. Well, the way this really works is we are always trying to strive for our programs to being upwards compatible or our cycles. So that means if we want to add functionality to a CAN cycle like cycle 800, what we do is we just add a few more options to the end of the cycle string more commas. So if you see that one machine has a cycle with more commas than the other, it's probably just running newer software because that's how it works. Now, if you methodize the cycle for older software, it should certainly still work in the newer software. So if you built your cycle 800 with 14 commas and the latest one's up to 16, and that was a fully functioning cycle 800, it, from a G-code perspective, it's still going to work fine. Now, there may be some new features you want to take advantage of, keeping your output code up to date with our cycle functions. That's why you would start to look at these comma places and could implement them from there. Okay, so one of the other things, and actually let me go back here for a second, is, and this is always a pain point for anybody posting externally, is this swivel data name. Now, the swivel data name, that's the TC1 that I kept choosing in our cycle mask. That name is builder definable. And in fact, every OEM changes the name. I have some OEMs that use multiple names within the same series of machines. So there's no consistency here when you're writing a post and you're methodizing cycle 800 what this name's going to be. 
So there's a couple things you could do as from the post development side. One of the first things, and I don't necessarily recommend it, but we're saying stating it right here, that if you don't have any value between the two quotations, and the machine has only one swivel data record, then that is a viable solution. It will only call up the first record. The problem is you're probably not going to know how many swivel data records this machine was commissioned for. So if you leave it and you make it your standard practice to leave the, the, the name, this, this swivel data name, always blank here, well, that's probably not going to work on every machine, uh, and more likely than not, it's it's not going to work. So one of the things that, that I use sometimes that I find pretty helpful is you can set up a variable inside the, the name of the record. Now, the name, since it's a name, is a string. So a string defines basically anything that can be used numerically and have letters in it. So it's some form of a name. Now, it could be numbers here. So for you to replace the quote and the name with something else, right? Down here we have the TC1. What you do is you have to define, define a string. So defining a string is as simple as giving a definition statement, typing the word string, and then in brackets telling it how many places, how large the string could physically be, end up being. So I just gave it 10 places. Then from there, you're going to give it some variable names, so a space and a variable name. So I called it underscore swivel. It does not have to start with an underscore, but you want to be very careful to not duplicate one of our system variables here. So I like to always use an underscore first because we don't use underscores for system variables. Then I'm going to set the string that I just created, the string variable, so underscore swivel, and I'm going to set it equal to and this name. So now I only have to change it in one spot. So if I get the wrong name and the, the user has to make an editing change, he won't have to do it in 30 cycle 800. He can just make the change right here in the header. And then down in my cycle mask, instead of having quotes in the name, I'm going to write whatever my string variable is. So in this case, underscore swivel. This is certainly a very viable solution. However, our cycle mask doesn't like it. So the only thing that this is going to do is if a user then wants to come in and edit the cycle 800 locally at the control, he will have to select the other one. So just because the accept's not here, this doesn't mean that this wouldn't run. This actually will run. So if I showed you a program here, this is that program I'm talking about. So here I defined a string of swivel and then inside the swivel cycle, I called it swivel. So if I was to simulate this real quick, you're going to see it's not going to give me ever any errors or any alarms. It's happy. But from the controls perspective, everything's good. So we'll just speed it up, whatever. There we go. OK. But if I open up the data mask, it is going to yell at me. It's going to say, hey, this, this, this record name doesn't exist. So if you want to do any editing at the control, you are going to then have to just toggle it to the appropriate name, hit accept, and then it'll build from there. But outside of that, this is a nice solution if you want to come up with something a little bit more universal from a post perspective when handling cycle strings like this. OK. So from here, I did want to give you guys a chance to see this part methodized out of a typical CAD CAM system. Um, in this case, I happen to use NX CAM. So just modeled, uh, basically I took the same model part that uh, I had made the print from, brought it into NX, laid a couple options of toolpath onto it. So just like we did before longhand, I did three different facing strategies, and then came in and milled out a little helical hole, drilled some holes, and then put my chamfer in. So I methodized the part posted it out through a post that was obviously native to NX, and then got my toolpath here. So, so we can go and actually take a look at this, and we can run it for you real quick, so you can get it just to get, it, get your eyes around it. So when we start to look at output toolpath, I mean, every post developer can do it a little different way, but this is pretty common from what you would see. So you're going to see some, some comments. 
obviously defining some specifics about maybe the print that was used, whatever, date and time. You may see some variable definitions. So this post happens to like to use the variable underscore cam tolerance in cycle, inside of cycle 832. So they're defining a real. A real or an integer would be a numerical value. A real supports decimal places. Integer would be a whole number. Then we're going to do that same method that we talked about earlier. You want to send the machine to a safe location with the tool carrier enabled. Then from there, cancel the offset. Do your standard safety line. If the post is supporting the blank, great. You can post it here. If it's not, I want to make sure certainly that I have a clamping there. Um, I can insert this manually. Then we have some comments. Here you see where they're setting the cam tolerance. And then later, when they use it, yep, there's an example of them using the Cycle 32 which is our high-speed function. But when we get down to the swivel cycle record, you can see it looks like just like we did on ours. So we can start to drive down. This is doing some toolpath. They're canceling their cycle 800. Here they did with the open and close parentheses. Now this is a little bit of a mix because, remember, we were talking about kinematic independent. This happens to have some rotary axes called out, at least in the retract strategy. So how do I move this to a different machine? This would have to be updated. But what's nice is it's only this. I wouldn't have to go into all the cycle 800s and update them. They would work on either types of machine kinematic, uh, BC or, or mixed kinematic. Um, then we're going to go and orient on R45. So they decided to use, again, axis by axis strategy in this post. And away we go. So the resulting toolpath is going to look basically the same as you saw it. It'll be slightly different, obviously, because the CAD CAM system is, oh, let me slow this down. I'll rerun it for you. And we'll do a little show tool path here. All right. So here's our cutting it. They're doing a little bit more optimized based on the surface. But I intentionally obviously methodized this thing so it would look like the part program we long handed or the example we went through here. And there we go. So that's really what you'll start to expect to see, start to expect to see methodized. One of the things you will see a lot more from a posted perspective is a lot more redundant commands and redundant structure. Um, a lot of times it just makes it easier when you're developing the post. So don't be surprised about seeing, um, you know, um, maybe uh, a, a, a feature being set multiple times over with the same value. Um, a lot of times there's not enough logic there in the post to say, hey, well, it was said earlier, I know it's modal. So you do get a little bit more redundancy um, in a, an output program, but you'll see that the structure is going to look the same as we did. Now, certainly the tool pathing, not common to see CAD CAM systems using our milling cycles, um, but absolutely from the drilling perspective. So if I go down here and I get to where we drill some holes, Right there, there's our cycle 83. So if I wanted to check this drilling cycle, and trust me, I did when I first played around with this post, first thing I did was open it up and make sure that the numbers seem legit. Now, the values look a little weird because from a CAD CAM perspective, they're going in and they're leaving the zero wherever the global part zero is. So when she tips up on some kind of an angle, right, when it rotates back, now the CAM system just compensates because it's never shifting like we did. It's never shifting to zero here. It's only doing a rotational value. So that's why the numbers might look a little strange because the zero is staying where it is. The, the orientation of the Z plane is following and the plane is being set up. It's just not on that surface. Okay. So the only other thing that I did want to touch real quick is um, when we start to run in auto mode, um, just a couple features that I find really helpful, especially when you get to five axis. 
Um, Mid-program start, we've gone through this a bunch in other webinars, and a lot of you guys that have had any exposure to our control are familiar with being able to start a program anywhere within the program. And if you use with calculations, it'll scan to that point, set up all modals, it'll set up all rotations, everything that occurred prior to it. But the other thing that's very handy when you get the five axis is this overstore mode. So this is kind of like having MDI in the middle of auto mode. So at any point when I'm running, let's say for argument's sake we are running this part, and we'll just get her moving a little bit. So let's say uh, my, my feed was wrong or I needed to move out and, and kind of get out of my position. So all I have to do is hit a cycle stop and my overstore button becomes active. Now I can come into overstore and I can treat this like a little MDI. So maybe I want to send my Z to, uh, I don't know, 100. Cycle start. And the machine will move to that location. I could have turned coolant on. I could have changed the feed rate. Whatever I want to do. Then once I back out of the mode, hit cycle start, it's going to reposition back to the point at which I stopped it at, and then continue moving. This is very handy when I have spindles, especially, that can rotate. Because I could be down inside a hole, I could be normal to that hole. So now, for me to pull out of that hole, I now have to move at some vector. I have to move a couple axes simultaneously. So, for me, I just did a simple Z, but it could have been moving three axes at a time. You know, you're going to do that. Also, as long as you don't shut the program down, the offset should stay active. So, I could go back and jog the machine if I wanted to. And worst case scenario, if I killed it in the middle of a rotation and I was down inside of a hole, I can also go back to my jog swivel screen and set with this set zero plane a temporary zero, establishing whatever offsets are here as a zero plane, and then I can move out Z normal that using that little WCS MCS trick I showed you. So those are just a couple of things that you may not have played around with from the three-axis world that become very handy when you're dealing with five-axis technology. Um, the overstore is certainly a big one there. Okay, so with that being said, I think we're at the end of the content. Yeah, here this was just showing you how you can move your zero anywhere on the part and the, the system will, will run that. But what I'd like to do is we went through a lot of material. Certainly would like to open it up to questions. So we have the um, chat window or the Q&A. Q&A would probably be a little easier for me. So if you guys have some questions specifically on the content or any content, feel free to, uh, to type them in or ask them. Okay. I know we covered a lot of material here. All right. So it looks like we have a question. Um, what do I, oh, oh, here is, is Sinutrain readily available to people like us? Absolutely. So uh, what we have for Sinutrain, um, and just to show you real quick, uh, I'm just going to go to Google here. One of the quickest and easiest ways to get a copy of Sinutrain is if you go to our CNC for You website. So what you want to do, let me see if uh, my Internet's going to want to run here. Um, but you want to go to our Siemens CNC for you, and what you can do is you can request a copy, and the if you don't have a full license, what it'll do is it'll run in trial mode, um, and the trial mode will basically allow you to manipulate the machines around. The only thing it doesn't allow you to do is just bring programs in and out. Um, if you want to then use it for uh, a tool where maybe you're debugging code, stuff like that, then you can get a full version. Um, certainly we can quote that to you. Uh, but the trial version uh, works out great for just kind of getting your head around, moving the machine around, playing with some tool paths, stuff like that. So CNC, the number four, and the word Y-O-U, if you just do a quick search for that, it's going to pop up, and you're looking for the URL that has industry.usa in it. And this is going to drive you right to our landing page. That's also the same page where you can go and you can get uh, access to all the webinar content. Uh, once you get there, there is an option. You've got to hunt around for it here. That allows us to uh, request a copy of Sydney Train. 
No, I don't want to waste a lot of time here for you, but it, it is on this website. If you can't find the link, uh, shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to get you the direct link right to it, but you can certainly request a copy. Um, would you align an edge before a plane, and would it then follow the plane align? So, um, and, and we did talk about that. So, so no, you never want to align the edge first um, because it, it doesn't know based on that orientation when you go to the aligned plane. So always do the plane first. Once you've aligned the plane, then you can present the edge because now once you've aligned the plane, that edge should be perpendicular to the plane. And then you find it. Same thing with finding a bore, right? If my bore wasn't perpendicular to my, my probe, I wouldn't want to go in and find the bore and then make the probe that bore perpendicular. So align the align the plane first. Great question, Mike. Thank you. Um, is there a way to update my sinew train? Um, so there is. Um, again, I can get you the link. You can come into here, or the other one I actually like to go to a lot is our German counterpart site because um, that also has sinew train that you can download. On our site right now, if you request it, we'll send you out a copy of it. If you go to our German colleagues, you can actually download it directly. It is quite large. Now, the one thing you want to pay attention to do with updating Sinew Train is what version um, you currently have, what your license version is. So if you have a version 4.5 license, that will support all the way up to version 4.5 edition 3. That was the version we were just running. Um, if you have, if you want to get into version 4.7, which are our latest version, it would require a new license. So from there, then you would have to purchase a new license again. So it, it would depend, uh, obviously, based on what version you have. But we do have um, a bunch of different versions for, for given licenses. Okay. Let me see if I. Uh, does the align edge with coordinate rotate then stack onto the found values for the pl from the plane? Okay, so this is where you want to be want to be a little bit careful. Um, not <laughs> not always. So so what the what the question is is if we were to come into jog to find an aligned plane. Right, he's using. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I misread it. So does the line edge with coordinate rotation then stack onto the values of the line plane? Yes, it does. So as long as you're using coordinate rotation, sorry about that, I misread it real quick. And that's back here, this coordinate rotation of the rotary axis. If I'm using the aligned plane, the coordinate rotation is just going to write to the other coordinate of those three axes. So that's really what you'd have to do when using the, the aligned plane in relation to the align edge function. If you use the direct axis function, then there, you're going to start to get offsets found in both the direct axis position as well as the coordinate rotation. And that's where you can run into trouble. OK. Um, how can we activate the simulation in the program? Uh, Max, I'm not sure if I follow. How do we activate the simulation in a program section? Um, so the machine itself should be commissioned to support it, um, if I'm following you correct. So oh, I guess my first question is, do you have the simulation button visible here? Um, simulation isn't an option. It's a standard feature. I have seen some builders, especially on real advanced machines, um, may not uh, support the simulation function or want to support it based on their crazy kind of kinematics. Um, so they may have inhibited it, but if not, you should be able to activate it. Now, as far as if you're going into the simulation and you're not seeing the blank, well, that's probably because the G-code program just didn't have the workpiece blank defined in it. So you can manually enter the blank like I did when I wrote the program, just simply by going to various, going to blank, and inserting it here. Additionally, if you go into simulation and the blank's not there, it'll start just moving the tool around, and you can actually go into show path and see it. But you also get, let me shut it off here, a blank button. So if you don't want to add the blank to the part program, let's say for argument's sake, the programs are locked and you can't edit them, but you want to get the, the 3D graphics up, come into the physical blank button, and it looks the same as the cycle. It's just not going to 
actually physically insert it in some part program. It's just going to set up the block there for you, whatever the dimension. So mine, see how it changed? Because I had some other numbers there. All right. Um, so the key is not available. Okay, this is back to the simulation question. So if the key is not available, the OEM is probably inhibiting it. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to um, go back to your OEM to find out why they're not um, allowing it to be activated. They may have some other reasoning from their end. Because um, normally, that button should always be there. Uh, what is the best uh, mythology uh, to machine parts that may not be aligned with a machine axis? So if the, the physical part program itself is aligned to the axis, but the, the actual part is not, well, that's where you're going to use those rotational commands like we talked about. So, I mean, that's the beauty of them. The part can be oriented anywhere. If the G-code program thought it was aligned to X, but you have a rotation about Z at the work hornet level, the machine will do all the compensation for you. So really, that's where it comes into play. Now, certainly, if the tool path was compensated already to be at some compound angle, then you're going to have to stage it relative to that because that's what she's going to do, right? So if the actual G-code program is doing X and Y motion to be parallel to a surface, you'd have to mimic that. But as long as the part program thinks it's straight, you can align that thing anywhere you want in space, any rotational value, any plane. And as long as the work coordinate values have the rotations, it's going to follow that orientation. Uh, So this was, uh, I'm working with Citrium 4.7, easy 2, and the keys have a gray color. Ah, this may be the little password level that you're into um, regarding your simulation question. So just for argument's sake, go to Menu Select, go to Setup, and set the machine to the manufacturer level. Um, it's probably sitting at level zero. So what you want to do there is you want to go in, you want to hit password, set password, it's all caps, type the word sunrise. Sunrise is going to put you to machine level, and then you're going to go from there. Okay. Um, great. Let me see, jump back to the window. Uh, how can I make sure that simulation matches my machine? Um, I'm assuming we're probably talking about from the SinuTrain perspective of the software we're in here. So one nice thing that SinuTrain does is it allows me to build a virtual machine from the physical machine archive of my machine. So I can actually have, and I'll show you guys here real quick, I have a whole library of different machines that I've built. So see all these machines here? Well, some of them were generic, but some of them you see, here's a DMG, Here's a Smithy machine, here's a Toolmax machine, there's a Romy machine, there's an MCO. These I built from archive files. So if you guys have CineTrain and you have a machine on your floor and you want to have one, um, you do need an extra license to build this. But if you like, you're more than welcome to email me over your archive and I'd be happy to build it for you. And then you can just import it. Now you do need the full version of CineTrain to be able to import um, externally created machines. Um, but outside of that, if you uh, if you need me to build you a virtual machine for your Cindy train that matches your physical machine, just create archive, email out the archive. Archives usually aren't more than four or five megabytes. Um, simplest way to create an archive: put a USB stick in your machine and do a Control Alternate S if you're on an 840 machine, or a Control Alternate C if you're on an 828, and it'll automatically dump an archive to the USB stick. Um, Keith asks, can you use a model for the blank? No, unfortunately not as of yet. Um, he also mentioned with a casting. So what I do in those cases is I just make sure my primitive blob, my primitive blank is just greater than whatever the part shape would be. And I would understand that there would be heavier cutting. Um, we're adding more and more of that functionality. Um, probably, I haven't seen any of this yet, but hopefully we're going to start to see this in the not so distant future. Not only that, um, but we're starting to add more capability of adding the work holding into like the machine space model and the collision avoidance. Um, so hopefully that's coming down, down the road. Okay. Um, 
So uh, there was a question, is it possible to download the presentation? Um, I don't post them, but um, they're certainly available. If anybody would like to get your hands on it, just shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to send it to you. I'll put up my info again here real quick. Uh, you guys had it from before. So if you just shoot me an email to Pollock at Siemens.com, I'd be happy to share um, any of that information with you guys. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all the great questions. Hopefully I didn't miss any. If I did, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to stop the recording now.